So this will be a video response to Crazy 2D Core's video titled Stay Homo Barking. Now I don't know if there's any drama that I haven't seen between the two and quite honestly I don't care, but I will address some of the arguments that this Christian makes in his video. But without further ado, let's go. But the reason we attack your fictional being is because you idiots think that he is real. You think that he is real. And that has motivated millions of people throughout history to commit countless genocides, filicides, infanticides. Yes. See, I will not deny that the name of God has been used to do all this. Well, yes and no. Murders have been committed in the name of God. We both know this to be true. Just as murders have been committed in the name of Allah, or Paulo, or of Thor. Um, that's not what the barking atheist is getting at. What he's saying, and what I agree with, is that religion turns normally moral people into doing immoral and sometimes evil things. For example, no sane man would want to pick up a baby boy look at it and go, well, that's a nice baby, I think I'll just hack away at its genitalia. No sane man would do that unless it was divinely warranted. As I've mentioned in previous videos, the connection here is faith. If your strength of belief and conviction is strong enough, then you could essentially do anything as long as your God tells you to do so. Because quite frankly, no matter how atrocious and how wicked the deed may seem to be, the person thinks in their mind that, well, as long as it's divinely warranted, as long as God tells me it's good, then I can do it. Now, granted, just because you're religious doesn't mean you're automatically immoral, but this is what religion can do to someone. It can make someone perfectly and normal into doing something immoral if they believe that it is divinely warranted. That's not what I have an issue with. What I have an issue with is what you say next. I teach the Israelites some lessons. I could see yeah. God did some things, but I mean, that's kind of like no worse than 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 uh, you know punishing your child. That's what God was doing. He was punishing his children. Judging by the casual and rather offhand way you compare how a father would punish his child to how God would punish us human beings really raises some questions about who you are. Either you do not understand the severity of the comparison you just made, or you either do understand and you don't care, and I hope that it's the former option and not the latter. Because even though I find both options rather reprehensible, I would prefer the first one any time. Because, well, then I would be happy to explain to you the large difference in how a father punishes his child compared to how God punishes us human beings. Quite frankly, I don't think it's morally acceptable for a father to rape his child if this child is misbehaving, nor do I think that his father has the right to starve his child or physically abuse his child in any way. I also don't think that any sane father would put his child in harm's way, the way God would put Adam and Eve into temptation. I mean, there is no way a sane father would do such a thing. And of course, no sane father who claims to love his son or his daughter would ever put them in eternal suffering if they didn't agree with it. That's not a father, that's a tyrant. And yes, God is a tyrant. So somehow, genocide, infanticide, filicide, murder, rape, theft, and all sorts of other atrocities are perfectly justifiable if a few of us live long enough to learn. I really hope that that's not the implication you're trying to get at. Religious folk fight against gay rights. They fought against women's rights. They fought against freeing the slaves. It is easier, it is much easier to take the bigoted position because the Bible states explicitly that women are not equal to men, that slaves should be beat, that gays should be killed. Well, yeah, um, well, number one, homosexuality is an abomination. 
Um, it doesn't say anything in there about killing them. It's just that they're an abomination. I mean, women are supposed to be servants to their spouse. Um, they're supposed to, according to the Bible, they're supposed to be, you know, just baby makers and housekeepers. And slaves, well, you know, wouldn't you like to have somebody that, you know, goes around and and does all your work, hard work for you? I mean, isn't wouldn't that be just ideal for you? I mean, what's the difference between having paid servants and slaves? Again, it seems to me that you have either not read your Bible or you haven't read it properly because there are several phrases that condemn homosexuals with the death penalty. As for whether or not homosexuality is a, an abomination, as you put it, that's really a matter of personal opinion. And I, for one, do not agree with you here because, well, there's nothing wrong with it. As long as a man is willing to love another man and it is perfectly consensual, then there's nothing wrong with it. Well, again, if you're going by the standards of your god, then yes, there is something wrong with homosexuality. But I'm not all that interested in doing what your god wants me to do, because I don't believe in your god, obviously. As for how a woman is supposed to be subservient to her spouse, um, that's again a matter of personal opinion. Uh, I do not agree with you because I personally have grown accustomed to Western morals and Western values where we value freedom and equality, which happens to include the equality of women, among many other types of minority groups. And according to your Bible, they're not just baby makers and housekeepers, they're just one step above a slave, which I'll get into later. But a woman is portrayed in the Bible as pretty much just a man's object, really. A woman is not given the same rights that a man is. For example, um, take for instance, if a man sleeps with a woman, then he must marry her or they both die. That clearly is an indication that the Bible does not treat women with the respect that they do deserve. And I'm hoping for all intents and purposes that you do not support this rather barbaric and um, unreasonable practice. As for the difference between a slave and a paid servant, well, there are many differences. One off the top of my head would be that a slave barely has human rights, whereas a paid servant has the exact same fundamental rights and freedoms that each and every one of us has. For example, you cannot uh, rape a paid servant, you cannot physically abuse a paid servant, whereas with a slave, many people did indeed rape their African-American slaves, and they did physically abuse their slaves as well. Paid servants also have better wages, less demanding working conditions, sometimes even compensation, whereas a slave would have none of these things. A slave is essentially someone who is forced to do the work, and is paid to continue to do the work. They were abused to the point where they were just barely surviving. And that's why we abolish slavery. There is a big difference between a slave and a paid servant. And I really hope you do recognize that. Tomatoes, apples, these kinds of things came about because animals saw them as desirable. Those plants who had desirable traits, such as taste or color, something that attracted them, were more likely to be eaten and have their seeds spread. Woohoo! Two at once! <laughs> really, really, well, that's what science books would tell you. If that's the case, then how did these plants become desirable? And what made the animals come to take them? I mean, what, did the animals just appear? Yeah. Judging by the rather heavily distorted view you present of the theory of evolution, it shows what a crass lack of knowledge you really have for even the most simple points of Darwinian evolution. For your information, plants get desirable traits through natural selection which is the mutation of certain genes which can either be beneficial or they can hinder the survivability of the species. Certain desirable traits might include brighter colors to attract different animals, uh, the production of either fructose or sucrose, which is something that animals have a natural instinct to consume, 
Certain flowers are even、uh, patterned in such a way as to attract pollinators to them. As these traits are desirable, they will be passed on to the future generation to ensure survivability. If a trait is not desirable, and that, if a trait hinders the survivability of a species, then that trait is either weeded out, or then it won't appear as often in the genetic code as desirable traits. For animals to recognize whether a plant is edible or not, well, sometimes they don't. But nature can give certain indicators to animals as to what is edible and what is not. For example,、um, sugars are a very good indicator of what is edible, and certain colors are nature's way of saying, well, this plant is edible and this plant is not. So, time for me to go. If you have any questions, let me know down below. Thanks for watching, and may the truth always be heard.